Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to this afternoon's proceedings. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's really a, an amazing occasion, is it not, uh, that we're all here today to celebrate the 60th anniversary of JCPP. Not my 60th birthday, by the way. As Robert pointed out, there's a slide that implies that both the JCPP and Pasco Firon are 60, <laughs> which is not yet quite true. Yeah, but I am... <laughs> um, so I, I very, very briefly, because I think we want to get to the science, which I, I know is what really unites us all, but so I just wanted to say a couple of things. First of all, how wonderful it is to see so many people here um, at all ends of the spectrum of research in child psychology and psychiatry, young early career researchers, senior professors. It's like a great big family reunion, as many of us uh, have said. A family reunion that is being web broadcast all over the world. Um, but it's really, it's really wonderful to see you all. And, and um, I wanted to sort of pick up on something that Edmund had said, which is, which is about the, you know, what is it that, well, that draws all of these people together to this field and that, that, that brings us all to be so appreciative of the journal. It's actually really hard to put your finger on exactly what that is. But um, there's something about the journal itself representing a very eclectic, pluralistic approach that is also curious, uh, it is uh, creative, and it's rigorous, and all of those things fitting together with the sort of overpinning ambition to do science for the betterment of children's lives is something I think everybody unites wonderfully behind, and I think it says something about the journal that it's managed to maintain that pluralistic, rigorous, um, and uh, a focus uh, that's, that's driving towards improving uh, child development and child outcomes and mental health. Um, and it says something also about our community as a group of scientists. So I, you know, I think there's a, actually a wonderful mirror uh, in the journal and the community itself. Uh, so I, I suppose I wanted to say, long may it continue, both in terms of the journal, but also us as a community that we support great science and we support each other in doing great science. Um, we are, uh, th th this afternoon we have the, uh, um, the, the, the uh, enormous, well I can't, I can't quite believe actually the, the group of people we have who are coming to now shift our attention away from necessarily specifically the journal or its history but to look forwards and think about the science of child psychology and psychiatry for the next 20 years. I, I know that you're going to be excited uh, to hear what our speakers have to say. We, um, uh, I mean, I'm a little bit astounded and awestruck uh, at the amazing group of people we've got uh, um, coming to speak to us today. I'm going to introduce all of them in one sort of long go, and then, I'll, uh, and then we'll, uh, rather than me jumping in every, uh, every uh, slot, which I think will get a bit distracting. So first of all, we have Tammy Moffat. Um, who everybody knows. Again, this is, I'm going to keep repeating that none of these people need any kind of introduction, but I'll do a very brief introduction. She's the Knut Schmidt Nielsen Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at uh, 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 Duke um, and at the SGDP at King's. Everybody, of course, knows her for, for, for being, again, one of the most creative, pluralistic epidemiologists in the field that, that we have known. She's been instrumental in, in the Dunedin study, uh, in, in, uh, began the E-Risk study, and all of the extraordinary findings that have arisen from those studies. She focuses on the development of antisocial behavior, gene uh, environment interaction, and many other outcome domains. She's a fellow of the British Cat. Oh, I'm going to get tired uh, with all of these amazing uh, uh, um, plaudits. Followed uh, uh, um, hot on her heels will be uh, Robert Plowman, uh, who's a professor of behavioral genetics at, at King's College London, a truly leading light in the, in the field of behavioral genetics, who I've had the great fortune to get to know somewhat over the years. It's been an, an enormous pleasure and really somebody who has been an inspiration to me for, for many, many years. Um, he, of course, has, has transformed the field of behavioral genetics in the last however many years. Um, and, and of course, also uh, with Judy Dunn, has done so much to help us understand not just nature, but also nurture and the non-shared environment, which is of course a, a, a huge uh, a, a contribution that continues, that we continue to, to develop and study uh, to this day. He is also a fellow of the British Academy uh, and in one of the most ranked, one of the most hundred uh, most influential psychologists of all times. Quite, quite an extraordinary impact. Uh, next, we have uh, uh, Brad Peterson, um, who's Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Southern California, and he's Director of the Institute for the Developing Mind at the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. He is one of the forerunners and leading lights in the field of pediatric neuroimaging and really has, has, has defined 
uh, the, uh, uh, our, our current approach to uh, neuroimaging around neurodevelopmental disorders, um, it, it beginning especially in the field of Tourette's and autism, and, uh, and, and has made an enormous contribution. He's also the most rigorous scientist and wonderful colleague on our uh, editorial board, um, and has also uh, has this very broad perspective as well. So in addition to looking um, at the neurobiological basis of neurodevelopmental disorders, he's doing exceptionally exciting research on the impact of toxins on neurodevelopment as well. So it's a very exciting scientist indeed. And next we have uh, Professor Maggie, Maggie Slowling, Snowling, beg your pardon, um, CBE. And she's president uh, uh, of St. John's College, Oxford. She's the past president of the Society for the Scientific Study of Reading. Um, many of you will know her. She's a past editor of the journal. Uh, her research has had a huge impact on our understanding of dyslexia uh, and of early intervention for reading disorders. Um, she is also a, a fellow of the British Academy uh, uh, and Academy of Medical Sciences um, and uh, a, a hugely significant figure in the field. And finally, uh, we have Frankie Happe, Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience and Director of the MRC SGDP Centre at King's College London another of the truly world-leading scientists we are very lucky to have uh, with us this afternoon. Of course, you know that her research is primarily on uh, the cognitive neuroscience of autism, but again, like many of our speakers this afternoon, has a very eclectic and, and creative uh, uh, approach combining neuroimaging, uh, 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 cognitive mechanisms approaches, looking at some underlying psychopathology as well, and thinking about intervention. Um, and so we couldn't really have had, uh, it, it literally is impossible that we could have had a better panel. Thank you to all our, our panelists. I'm going to invite uh, our, our first uh, speaker, who will be Tammy Moffat. Great. Thank you, Pasco. And happy birthday to JCPP. I feel like we should all be wearing birthday hats for the, uh, for the television. Right, so I'd like to use my 10 minutes today to tell you some surprising findings about mental disorder from a four decade longitudinal study. And I'm referring to the Dunedin Longitudinal Cohort Study that takes place in New Zealand. The study has now survived four editions of the DSM. Uh, like many of our, our colleagues here. Uh, the psychiatric diagnostic interviews began in 1982 and are still ongoing now in the middle of 2019. So we asked three overarching questions of these data. Who gets mental disorder? When? And do people retain the same diagnosis over decades of their lives? Uh, this shows you the design of the study. It began in 1972 as a one-city birth cohort. On the left, you can see that the Dunedin study has assessed mental disorders on seven occasions. At each wave, we used a past year reporting period. And on the right, you can see, uh, especially down at the bottom, uh, that the study has had good retention over the years, with 92% of the study members taking part so far at age 45. And we have a few more months remaining. This is a list of the 17 DSM disorders that have been assessed by interviewing each study member privately. Uh, I've organized them here in this talk by family. So we have the externalizing family, the internalizing family, and the thought disorders family. And we included OCD among the thought disorders because when we first started working on this, it was being considered by the DSM-5 working group as a thought disorder, uh, and factor analysis has subsequently showed that it fits nicely with mania and schizophrenia. Study members have to meet the diagnostic criteria according to the DSM. We also require self-rated uh, impairment and we document corroboration of key symptoms by informants. Now I'm showing you the most surprising finding um, first. Across four decades of life, the cohort members have moved in and out of internalizing, externalizing, and thought disorders. I'll walk you through this slide. Uh, up at the top, you see a, a thin black line which represents the study members who have died over the course of the study. Down at the bottom, there's in gray, it shows those who have missing data at any given period. The green shows periods when each study member was well and had no disorder. 
uh, to represent disorder, the blue equals internalizing, red equals externalizing, yellow equals thought disorders, and then the blended colors represent times when people had multiple families of disorder. For example, purple shows people who had both internalizing and externalizing. Each column of this chart is one of the study waves with age 11 on the left and age 45 on the right. So it turned out to be quite rare for an individual to keep one diagnosis or even to keep with one, within one of the diagnostic families. This is just a quick glimpse and I'm going to now unpack the data and then I'll come back to this chart later. So here you can visualize the raw data of the study. Each column is one of the steady, uh, seven study waves from 11, uh, age 11 to age 45. Uh, each horizontal line represents one of the 1,037 study members. Yellow shows you a time when the study member had a disorder. Uh, on the bottom left, you can see about one-third of the cohort had onset of diagnosis, uh, research diagnosis by age 15. Green shows you a time when each study member is free from disorder, and if you look up at the very top right, you can see there were very few study members who were left by age 45 this year who had never had any research diagnosis of mental disorder. The darker orange colors and brown colors show you periods when the study member had more comorbid disorders. If you look down at the bottom right, you can see that those who had onset youngest had a pattern of more comorbid disorder and more persistent disorder across time. So now I'll just delve into these data. So how many people experienced a mental disorder in the first half of the life course in this cohort? The answer is 85% of the cohort had onset of a disorder by age 45. Now you're probably shocked and wondering, is the Dunedin cohort study the only study to show this very high lifetime prevalence rate of disorder? So this shows you prevalence rates, lifetime, from five longitudinal cohort studies done in three countries that have carried out repeated diagnostic interviews over time and counted disorder as it accumulates. The cohorts report prevalence uh, totaling somewhere between 65% and 85% lifetime, and that looks fairly similar to what we get in the Dunedin study. The highest lifetime prevalence rates are being reported from the study that started the youngest and that have had more waves of assessment, which makes sense. So at what age do most people experience their first disorder? Uh, in the Dunedin cohort, about 35% of the study members had their first diagnosis by age 15, another 25% by age 18, totaling to about 60% or two-thirds who had onset as a child or adolescent. Good news for JCPP. Okay, so is early onset of disorder a harbinger of more disorder to come? This chart shows you that early onset predicts more subsequent years with disorder in a lifetime. Each column, again, is a wave of the study. The darker brown colors, oops, sorry, I'm not getting there yet. The darker brown colors show you that more study waves uh, with a diagnosis. If you look to the left side of this chart, you see the study members who had the earliest onset as a young person tended to have disorder at four years, five, six, or even seven out of the study, subsequent study waves. This chart shows that study members with early onset also tended to experience more different types of diagnoses over their lifetime. So here, again, the darker brown color represents more diagnoses accumulated. On the left, you can see that those who had their onset as a young person tended to have three or four or five or even more different kinds of diagnoses over their lives up to age 45. So does anyone retain just one exclusive diagnosis over the lifetime? Do people tend to stay with a disorder within a disorder family over their lives? This is an important pragmatic question for us because so much of our work as, a mental, as mental health professionals is diagnosis driven. We have specialist clinics for depression, for ADHD, for substance abuse, for psychosis, and so forth. We have treatment protocols that are tailored to a specific diagnosis. We have journals that are disorder specific, and in the United States we even have funding agencies that are disorder specific. Uh, 
So this chart shows you that in the Dunedin cohort, uh, members who ever had a disorder, fewer than 10% retained one single diagnosis type over their lifetime. On the left, if you look at the left blue column, uh, this represents those who ever had any internalizing disorder. Down at the bottom, the very darkest blue part, are those who kept their specific internalizing diagnosis, such as major depressive disorder or panic disorder. That was only 12.7% of those with internalizing disorder. The medium blue part shows that 18% had a comorbid diagnosis, but it stayed within the internalizing family. I think this is what I expected to happen. But then the surprise is at the lightest blue part, which shows that 69% of those with an internalizing disorder also had diagnoses that went outside the internalizing family, and they developed an externalizing disorder or a thought disorder. Uh, the situation was similar for people who had an externalizing disorder. That's the red column. 75% of them also had internalizing or thought disorders over the course of the study. And then if you look at the yellow column, you see all but one individual with a thought disorder also had diagnoses in the other families as well. So do people experience different kinds of psychiatric disorders across their life course in some sort of meaningful sequence or pattern? You saw this chart before. Over the four decades, people have lots of different disorders, and they have them at different times, and they move between types of disorders in patterns that are nearly random. The data point to something like a hydraulic process. Um, there's a general liability for psychopathology, and it flows through the life course like an underground river. And at different times, it comes to the surface and bubbles up, but each time it can take a different form of a disorder or syndrome over the life course. This chart shows you the same analysis, but just now for the 72 members of the Dunedin cohort who have been treated as an inpatient for a mental disorder or a substance abuse uh, treatment at some point during the four decades. Only two of these 72 patients retained one single pure diagnosis family over the four decades. And this means that serious cases who are found in clinical settings are highly likely to cross disorder families when followed up later. So what did we learn from analyzing four decades of diagnostic data? First, we learned that mental disorder affects virtually everyone, eventually, if you live long enough. Secondly, mental disorder typically onsets by adolescence, and if so, it persists decades thereafter. Uh, we learned that nobody gets just one disorder and keeps it very long. Uh, and we learned that over the decades, individuals experience many changing disorder types and shift freely between internalizing, externalizing, and thought syndromes. Um, this uh, kind of evidence is suggestive of the hypothesis that all psychiatric diagnoses share some common forms of etiology. I think it also suggests that when we meet a clinical patient or a research participant, we should think of this person not as a person who embodies their current presenting diagnosis, but as a person who had different disorders in the recent past before we met them, and a person who's going to have yet other different disorders if we would see them again in the near future. So that's what I know about epidemiology. Thank you. Can I invite you up to the stage, Robert? I, was going to, I forgot to say that what we'll do, please hold your questions because we're going to have uh, general questions right at the end. Uh, we've got lots of time, so hold on to your questions and we'll have quite a wide discussion, I hope. Um, Robert, come to the stage. Thank you. Just click down. Fifteen years ago, we didn't have any genes that were associated with complex behaviors. And we had the power to detect some large effects, but we were beginning to think that maybe the biggest effects were a lot smaller than anyone thought. And I did think back then that 
we could at least put them together like items on a scale and predict even if there were lots of genes of small effect. Ten years ago at the 50th, anniversary, uh, 50th uh, party for the journal, um, the first genome-wide association studies were being done, and for the first time we really were getting replicable associations, but it proved that the biggest effects are incredibly smaller than anyone ever thought, far less than 1 percent of the variance, and that meant that to account for heritability you'd need hundreds, and we now think thousands of inherited DNA differences to account for heritability. But even so, you could put them together in sets of genes, and you could use them to ask important research questions about development, multivariate issues, and interplay between genes and environment. So you notice that first paper was called, When Are We Going to Be There? So when are we going to be there? And the answer is now. How are we going to get there? Large genome-wide association studies. And where is there? And this is the point of my talk. I think it's polygenic scores. So I won't have time in my 10 minutes to give you all the background here, but you all know you can get DNA from any tissue. Every cell from the first cell with which we began life and from, you know, which we now have trillions of cells all have the same DNA. So you can get DNA from any cell, mostly from blood or from urine, but often in these uh, kits from saliva. Then you, you genotype DNA differences throughout the genome. SNPs is one type. It's a single nucleotide polymorphism. And um, you genotype hundreds of thousands of them spread out throughout the genome, and you correlate each one with some trait. It could be reading ability or schizophrenia, autism. And you have to correct for a million multiple tests. But even so, those genome-wide association studies, once they got large enough to detect these small effects, are detecting a lot of significant hits. And then, what are you going to do with effects that are so small? It's like items on a test. You don't have a scale with just one item. You put a lot of items together. And together, they can often be importantly predictive. And that's what we mean by a genome-wide polygenic score. They're generically called polygenic scores. I call them genome-wide to distinguish them from just taking a bunch of, say, candidate genes and putting them together. These are, it's an atheoretical approach looking across the genome, genome-wide. And the second reason is I can never resist a good acronym, GPS. Okay, so we have hundreds of these polygenic scores now. Most of the work has gone on with uh, major psychoses. Schizophrenia, we can predict with DNA alone 7 percent of the liability. But the uh, surprise in the last two years has been educational achievement. We can now predict 15 percent of the variance in GCSE scores with DNA alone. Childhood behavioral problems haven't had the uh, funding that the big boys have had, but even with just, here's what you're talking about, 20,000 cases, they're still explaining almost as much variance, you know, ADHD, perhaps 6 percent of the variance. And it is the variance. You can use a continuous measure. These aren't just diagnostic specific. In fact, they're contrary to that. They're saying there are only dimensions. So if the future is here, what's the future? And I think it's better polygenic scores. And how are we going to get there? Well, most of the life sciences deal with this. It's called the missing heritability gap. And what people mostly mean by that is the gap between how much variance we can predict with known GPS, polygenic scores, say like in the case of reading, we're talking about 10 percent of the variance, versus how big the heritability is, which is typically 50 percent. That's, that's the gap people talk about. But importantly, there's two types of missing heritability. The GPS is limited to the SNPs that are on the chips that we use to genotype. Those SNPs are common SNPs. Most DNA variation is rare. By common, we mean 1 percent of people have it. So um, that's missing GPS heritability, and the way to beat that is to have um, we, if we have larger samples, we can get up to 25 percent heritability, but the current chips, we can't get beyond that. That's the ceiling. So how are we going to get to twin heritability? And most people believe oops, that it's going to, we're going to have to have other DNA differences. And the way it's going to go is the whole genome sequencing. There you've got all three billion base pairs of DNA, not just a sample of a few hundred thousand DNA differences. Okay, so that's what everybody's doing in the life sciences. But for us, I think what's far more interesting is to get 
better polygenic scores that are more specific. So the winner of all these polygenic scores is the absolute worst coarsest variable you can imagine, years of education. But because it's included in every GWAS study, you get samples of over a million, and as a result, you get a polygenic score that predicts everything better than anything else. It predicts mental health better than anything else, because what does it take to get through university? It doesn't just take intelligence or achievement. It takes stability, persistence, and mental health. But wouldn't it be great if we were able to look at more specific cognitive abilities, STEM subjects? We could look at these things independent of G, which interests me a lot. We could also do that for behavior problems. I mean, as Timmy was pointing out, a bit subtly, I think, but the point of it is that you know, we really need to take this P idea seriously. But we can look for specific problems independent of P. And we can do age-specific, environment-specific, treatment-specific polygenic scores. But to do that, we're going to need these huge GWAS studies. So how are you going to do that? Well, the way things have been done so far, like with educational attainment, is to just put lots of studies together and meta-analyze them. But then you have diversity of samples and measures. And how are you going to get something specific, like reading specific problems? One way is through the national biobanks, like the UK Biobank. Uh, Genomics England is now going to try and sequence a million people. US has started a project with a million. But you still got to get people tested in those samples. And you know, it's going to be difficult. Direct-to-consumer testing, over 15 million people have paid to have their genotyping done. And 80% of them agree to participate in research, and a lot of that is psychological research. So that's another angle. But here's my, my big reveal. How are we going to do it? I think we're going to have universal genotyping on the NHS. And we already do it for neonates. We do it badly. We only genotype a few genes. We ought to be doing SNP chips, no question about it. But more than that, I think we ought to make genotyping available for everyone. Finland has begun to do this. It'll be done for health. You can predict cardiovascular disease better with DNA than anything else. 8% of the UK population is walking around with a three-fold greater than average risk for having a heart attack. You can prevent this. You can prevent a lot of disorders. And DNA is the best predictor in town. It'll be done for <laughs> medical disorders. But once you do the DNA, the genotyping, you can get any of these hundreds of polygenic scores. So alcoholism, you can't become alcoholic if you don't drink a lot of alcohol. Obesity, but well, we all know you've got to prevent diseases, and this is the way to do it. Um, so I was going to say, you know, with universal genotyping, the NHS, I'm surprised to see people go, oh, my God. But I thought it was the big reveal. Then did you see last week's Times front page? Dean tests for sale on the NHS, being Tories, you know, of course they'll charge for it. But actually, it's not a, we can discuss this later. There's a lot of things to discuss later. But the Twitter sphere went into fibrillation with this. So I decided I'd write something. I wrote it for The Spectator on the huge advantages for the NHS that this could be done. And so um, I hope we can discuss these sorts of issues later. You got a phenotype, too, though, if you want to do a GWAS. But again, the NHS has these. Electronic health records, I know there's problems, but there's a lot of data there that other countries wouldn't have. And people may not know that um, the National People Database has data on 26 million kids in the UK, a lot of data. Um, and you can do web-based collection and get a lot of data on specific things, you know, not just coarse variables. And um, data mining without even contacting people, you can get an awful lot of information. So I think that universal genotyping is going to transform how we do research, because any subject you study will already have their genotyping done. And eventually, then, that will also transform the clinic. So you think about the advances in the last 10 years, the mind boggles at what we're going to be talking about 10 years from now. Thank you. Uh, let me introduce the next speaker. It's a great example of JCPP. Brad Peterson, we were just having coffee, and I was telling about the study I was going to design. He listens five minutes, and he says, you know, actually, if you did it this way, it would be a lot better, completely different from what I was going to do. And absolutely right. So thank you, Brad. Thank you.
just want to remind Robert that um, even a blind squirrel occasionally finds a nut. <laughs> Let me see here. I've got to find my talk. Where is it? Okay, here we are. So, um, Eric initially spoke about the importance of, of the journal and, uh, and the work that we do in terms of clinical translation and how critical that is to our, our aims of uh, what we do as scientists and clinicians. And um, uh, Edmund spoke about the holy grail that was with impact factors. But here in, in imaging world and most of neuroscience, I think, the holy grail would be using our biomarkers, in my instance, it would be brain images to diagnose psych psychiatric illness. So MRI scanning was first introduced for clinical use in 1984. Its application to the study of neuropsychiatric disorders soon followed, and I joined the field in 1990 as a postdoctoral fellow at Yale. Since then, the holy grail of imaging research, for me and for most MRI researchers, I would say, has been to use MRI to improve clinical care in the lives of patients, either to help diagnose psychiatric illness or to identify biological subtypes that will aid in predicting the future clinical course of illness or the response to treatment. My assumption then until recently was that finding the holy grail would translate immediately and easily to clinical application and dissemination. I mean, how could it not? If you can diagnose psychiatric illness with imaging, wouldn't that automatically translate to clinical practice? Well, that proved to be a very naive assumption, as the hurdles leading from neuropsychiatric discovery to clinical translation are formidable. And in fact, the discovery marks only the beginnings of a much longer ongoing quest. And in this brief talk, I'd like to give a, an example of a discovery from my laboratory and the hurdles to its clinical application that I hope will be broadly relevant to other neuroscientific discoveries, including you know, uh, SNPs, uh, polygenic scores, uh, and any other neuroscientific bio, uh, biomarker. So let me give you a, a conceptual framework for, for and, and a little bit of historical framework for how this went and, and how we came up with our way of using MRI to diagnose psychiatric illness. So in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, the first MRI studies were really applied to schizophrenia. The aim was to show that it had a biological basis, if you can imagine that in the brain. Um, the, the first studies were looking at overall brain volume. And in fact, many studies showed that on average, schizophrenic people have smaller volumes of their brain. When they tried to use that as a diagnostic marker, it failed miserably. And we'll talk about why that is briefly. Um, here's an, an overall brain. And obviously, you know that it, it's composed of many different brain subregions. There's a lot of variability in each of those subregions that contribute to overall variance of brain size. So if you were to remove an entire gyrus or the entire right frontal lobe, for example, you have enough variance remaining in the rest of the brain and probably compensation for having removed that dysfunctional part of the brain that it would um, hypertrophy and it would um, mask the massive underlying volume deficit that you had so that overall volume still wouldn't be a, an, a, a decent marker. So subsequently, people went to smaller brain regions thinking that that would be the trick. So probably the most studied region would be the amygdala hippocampus here, looking straight on. Here's the top of the head, bottom of the head. Tiny structures about so big in, in the human brain. But those two obviously are very structurally and functionally heterogeneous. So the amygdala and cross-section has all these subnuclei that each does a different thing in information processing. And each one of them has a lot of variability. So you remove one of those, and you still have a lot of variability in the overall structure. Similarly, for the hippocampus, lots of different uh, sub-portions of the hippocampus, and, and the same for the thalamus, lots of subnuclei in the thalamus. So going smaller, only going smaller, doesn't buy you out of anything. The, the, the same degrees of sensitivity and specificity were found. And this is. Um, showing you a little bit more what I mean by that. These are actual data from our lab. So here are schizophrenic adults. Here are healthy controls. On the y-axis is overall volume of the hippocampus. 
the means are shown here, horizontal bars, and the whiskers are the uh, standard errors. And you can see the overlap in overall volume of the hippocampus. Now, this produces poor sensitivity and poor specificity if you're using the overall volume because healthy controls, those who are, have smaller hippocampuses, will often be misclassified as schizophrenic. Schizophrenic people with larger volumes will often be misclassified as controls or healthy. That leads to poor sensitivity, sensitivity, poor specificity. So here's in general what we were trying to do that's quite different than that. We're trying to um, take into account the different portions of the hippocampus that do different things functionally in terms of information processing. So this is the medial, a medial view of the hippocampus. Here's the head, body, and tail. We can take a large sample of, of schizophrenic and healthy people, overlay those hippocampuses one on top of another, and millimeter by millimeter, we can compare the surface indentations or protrusions. We can think of it as local volumes in schizophrenic versus healthy controls, and then we color code that. We color code it so that if, if, if you see blue, it means it's smaller in the schizophrenic group, so it's smaller in the head. Red means it's larger, so it's larger in the anterior body. Green means there's not any real significant difference between the two. And then purple, again, means it's massively reduced in size of the tail. So these are the differing portions, functional units, of the hippocampus. And what we tried to do in this algorithm, I, th I think we largely succeeded, is to say, OK, you have a, a person. You want to know, is this schizophrenic or a healthy person? We would um, define their hippocampus. And essentially what our algorithm does is it says, does this person tend to have a small head of the hippocampus, an enlarged anterior body, a sort of normal mid-body, and a drastically reduced tail? So you can think of it like the, the fingerprints on, and the dermal, dermato, dermatomal ridges on your fingers that have um, a, a surface morphology. And we're trying to capture that entire um, morphology in a single glance, and that's what we're doing, and that's what we're asking in our algorithm. We're not asking it only in the hippocampus. We ask it in the amygdala. We ask it in the basal ganglia and thalamus. We ask it at the surface of the brain, and we're saying collectively across all those surfaces in the brain, it, does this person tend to map onto and look like a schizophrenic individual versus others that we have compared them to, okay? So conceptually, that, that's what we're doing and trying to do. And so this is showing you more proof of concept at the level of the cortex for different disorders. So here's Tourette syndrome in our data sets. They tend to have, in red, enlarged frontal and parietal lobes bilaterally, uh, reduced temporal lobes, and kind of normal elsewhere. Um, that's very different than, say, ADHD, which has reduced temporal lobes bilaterally, but it reduced um, inferior frontal volumes bilaterally. That, in turn, is very different than these other conditions. So familial depression, we've shown, um, has reduced cortical thickness in the uh, right hemisphere, but not the left, so it's very asymmetric. That's very different than bipolar disorder, which goes the opposite direction, which has cortical thickening bilaterally and symmetrically. So familial depression, bipolar, very, very different, and very different than schizophrenia. So you can think of these as neural fingerprints for families of conditions, and that's what we're trying to capture. I'm going to tell you really briefly, sort of glossing, how we actually achieve that technologically. So first we had to define all these surface that has, surfaces in, in very, very carefully to um, so you can't just automate this. It has to be very precisely defined. Secondly, and more importantly, we then had to capture that spatial variation. We had to capture the vari that, that neural fingerprint, if you will, um, um, in order to feed it into a classification algorithm. So how we capture this, I would say this is really the key of the, the technology or the algorithm, is we first treated each of these structures. Topologically, they're, they're a sphere, even though they look you know, they're stretched, but essentially they morph to a sphere. And that has an advantage because then we can apply an engineering tool called a spherical wavelet transform. I'm going to show you an example so you don't have to freak out about that. The, the, the spherical wavelet transform has a couple of um, really massive advantages. One is it allows us to capture in a few numbers, a few variables, that complex spatial variation across the entire brain. 
It also has, functions as a data reduction technique. So if you look across all these surfaces, there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of points. That, that, those are too many variables to feed into machine learning algorithms. You don't get stable results. We had to reduce the data, and, and so the, the spherical wavelet transform uh, um, served that purpose for us. This is just showing you proof of, of concept as well. We did a lot of computer simulations to prove that we, we could actually do this. So in normal brains, we introduced deformations. Uh, here's a protrusion. Here's an indentation. We did it in a lot, a lot of brains. We would capture that spatial variation uh, by first uh, warping this and morphing it to the unit sphere here. The red shows the enlargement uh, on the surface that we introduced. Then we used the spherical wavelet transform to reduce the data set. So this is showing you with lots of uh, scaling coefficients or vectors. This is with um, far fewer and far fewer yet. And you can see that we can still, with very few variables, we can capture that spatial variation very, very efficiently. That then feeds into a machine learning algorithm. So um, we, we did use machine learning. This was hierarchical clustering, machine-based. This is unsupervised learning. So briefly what we did, let's say we took all the schizophrenic brains and all the healthy brains. Um, we threw them into a bucket, and we asked the machine learning algorithm, give us two naturalistic groupings based on all of the neural fingerprints that you're able to, to discern. Just two naturalistic groupings. We did, it just did it automatically and blindly, and then we kind of looked at it, see what we got. Now, it could have classified two groups based on sex, or age, or socioeconomic status, or any other features. We didn't know. It happened to break it down across diagnostic lines, so we would get all schizophrenic and all healthy controls. Just sort of, I mean, it was absolutely stunning, right? So we wanted to do that more rigorously, um, and we did it with a, a split half validation scheme. So for each of these comparisons, schizophrenia versus controls, Tourette's versus controls, Tourette's versus ADHD, all the combinations, um, we threw the brains, well, we randomly sampled half of the brains from each group. We didn't know what they were. We mixed them up, put them into a bucket, generated the classification. So now we have a classification scheme developed in half the data set. And in the other half, we bring in a brain one at a time completely blindly and automatically, and said, how does the classification perform? Does it take the schizophrenic brains and put them with the schizophrenic bucket and controls and so forth? And it turns out it did it incredibly well. Now, the split half uh, scheme and, and tech, uh, technique has massive advantages because we could do that many times. So we're generating not just a single al algorithm. We could generate 10 or 50 or 100 different algorithms and see how each one performed. And the fascinating thing is each time we generate an algorithm, it pulled out the same features of the brain that were uh, across algorithms that were, were performing the classification. So that says that the algorithm is very, very robust with respect to which brains are that it's learning on. OK, so that was really critical. OK, so here's how it performed. So ADHD versus healthy controls. Not all regions entered in and were informative, but cortex, hippocampus, amygdala, basal ganglia were. So we had about 94% sensitivity, 90% specificity. Tourette's versus healthy, you can see the informative regions, 95% uh, sensitive, 79% specific. So it was getting it wrong in some of the controls. Schizophrenia and healthy, you see it, 93 and 95. Bipolar and healthy, 100 and 96 specificity. So those are all with healthy controls. You could say, yeah, well, that's simple. How about diagnostic groups of clinical relevance? So bipolar and schizophrenia, that can be hard clinically to discern. And here we got 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity. Now, it's performing even better than in controls because the brain abnormalities are going in very different opposite directions. They're thicker in uh, bipolar and reduced in schizophrenia. Tourette's versus ADHD, nearly perfect. I, this is a, a little bit of a complex slide. These are the dendrograms that uh, are, the, are the result of the machine classifications. Individual subjects on the x-axis, uh, classification metric on the, on the y. I want to 
emphasize a couple things. You can see how, how it performs some of these classifications and with essentially no overlap between schizophrenia and bipolar. But here's the, the, the really important thing, I think, is you have, see a lot of evidence for biological subgroups within each of these disorders. So it offers the prospect and promise of being able to um, provide biologically, morphologically defined subgroups of these disorders that we can then map and find what are the regions that are, are producing that. And it suggests that within these DSM classifications, yes, there's biological heterogeneity, but there's an overall family resemblance in these conditions that allow the, the, the classification to work. That's really critical, um, I think. So um, after that, so we, we had that kind of worked out by 2011 or so. And it took about a year to get the backing of the university to say, yeah, we're, we're going to back this and financially push the, um, the patent and the FDA approval and so forth. They're very reluctant to, to fund algorithms, by the way. They want hardware. They want genes. They want stuff that you can hang on to. Algorithms they don't like too much. But they finally agreed. Patenting took us six years. There are reasons why. So FDA doesn't like to approve algorithms either. Here they said, yeah, well, you know, people have used the, the spherical wavelet transform. They've used MRI. They've used machine learning. And that's like taking the wires and capacitors and resistance, uh, resistors and throwing them together and getting a ham radio. And, um, and they were saying that's inevitable. Someone would have done it. It's, it's prior art. So we finally had convinced them. Uh, we had to become more and more specific about the configuration of the radio that we were building. Took us about six years and more than 50 deliveries of pitch decks to, to, con to get um, a CEO and investors, ultimately, who would support this and push it to the next level, which I'll describe briefly. We went to the FDA and said, actually, there was a real question. Do we need FDA approval for this? We never intended it as a standalone device. It would be an aid to clinicians. And you know, was it, did it require FDA approval? It wasn't so clear, um, but ultimately, yes, we do. And the FDA regards it as so disruptive, there's nothing like it out there, that now um, it has to go through a de novo pathway, which means the, the standards for, for proving that this works are very, very high. So that required us, in turn, to seek $5 million in funding, which we just got last month. Um, we have to bring the software coding up to industry standards, and then about $4 million to conduct a prospective trial in newly um, presenting patients to see if this works in them. And this is only for one indication. It'll be for ADHD versus controls. You can multiply all this by each of the other indications. So that's really the bottom line. I just wanted to point out that you know, you think it's going to be easy. You come up with something that you think is really fantastic, and, it, and this is uh, uh, seven years since we had the answer, what we think is an answer, an answer, not the answer, and it's at least another three or four or five years before we would get FDA approval, and then you have to bring it to market. So it's a daunting task. I mean, absolutely daunting, and because of that, the quest just like Monty Python will continue. Thank you very much. Wow, I have to say, follow those three talks. I work on reading and language. These are cognitive skills that are normally distributed in the population, so why have I been invited? Well, I think it's because of the disorders of reading and language, language disorder, or DLD as we now call it, and dyslexia. And I think um, the importance of these disorders is for clinicians is that they are very common, they affect learning and educational attainment. 
they lead to low self-esteem and often poor mental health outcomes are associated with them. Now DSM-5, to my mind, unhelpfully separates language disorder from dyslexia. Language disorder is classified as a communication disorder affecting receptive and expressive language. And dyslexia is classified as a specific learning disorder which affects the development of fluent reading and spelling, that is decoding. Researchers have built on that um, and I think colluded um, to say that dyslexia is associated with phonological deficits, whereas developmental language uh, disorder is more commonly associated with reading comprehension impairments. So why have researchers ended up colluding that these are two separate disorders? I think that's because they've uh, strictly adhered to discrepancy definitions of disorder. So they've recruited to their clinical samples children who have normal or above average IQ with a reading or language impairment, so they're studying very pure disorders, and they've also tended to do many case control cross-sectional studies, and that still goes on. I think a major issue for our field is to understand how we can meaningfully describe disorders that affect learning in this way on what are essentially uh, dimensions and um, it's really crucial that we continue to try to understand this relationship. Now, of course, language and reading are complex systems with subsystem, subsystems that can dissociate, but also they share variants. Recent longitudinal studies suggest that contrary to the prevailing view that phonological skills are the predictors of individual differences in learning to read, actually language is the foundation of learning to read. Illustrated in this schematic, are data from um, a longitudinal study that we've done, there are others, which show that um, language at the age of three predicts at the age of around five what is now generally regarded as the triple foundation, which is a universal foundation for learning to read across cultures, comprising letter sound knowledge, phoneme awareness, and also tapping rapid naming skill and that following uh, that triple foundation, phoneme awareness and letter sound knowledge predict individual differences in the ability to decode as measured by uh, reading accuracy. The predictors of reading comprehension are reading accuracy together with language. And in our data, we show that language measured at age three has a long range effect on reading comprehension outcomes at the age of eight. We can also use this kind of model to start to try and understand the risks of reading impairment. And clearly, what this model shows is that language is a major risk factor for poor reading. But there could be other specific risk factors as well. And at the uh, age of around five, when the phonological demands of learning to read are coming to play, uh, this is a point in development when more specific deficits in phonological processing would be expected to impact the process, and in my view, that is still the uh, most obvious candidate end of phenotype for dyslexia. After that stage, what we require children to be able to do to read fluently is to practice reading. So now, print exposure, the how many books in the environment come in, all together to predict how well a reader we are. So this kind of model can, can help us to um, identify risk factors for poor literacy. And what it shows is that language has both a direct and an indirect mediated effect on reading comprehension outcomes. And of course, we know by now that um, developmental disorders are the uh, outcome of multiple risk factors. But I think there's some complicated issues here because we also know um, from longitudinal studies that there's considerable stability in the development of reading and in the development of language. And what that really means is that individual differences in these skills don't change very much over time. In fact, the only instability is at the beginnings of learning in both of these domains. So we have a relatively small window for interventions. I also think we need to be mindful of the fact that our current models of learning to read don't necessarily include what you might call third factors. One that I've become particularly interested in is executive function, 
because in much of the research that we've done, we find that executive function is a very strong correlate of performance on many reading-related tasks. But when you pit it against language, which, which it co-varies with very strongly in a longitudinal model, executive function drops out so that it's not considered a predictor. And then in terms of what, how people move from that kind of theory to practice, they don't think about the role of skills like executive attention, which surely must impact the process of learning. Similarly, there's as yet no uh, such models that look at factors beyond cognition and yet clinically we know that personality and temperament are very important factors in determining how, how well a child will learn and I would also say in how well a child copes with something like a reading or language impairment. So I think um, a challenge is to ensure that this kind of um, policy-making statement, which I'm not going to quote who, t who said this, uh, should not be allowed. So policymakers often believe that the route to good reading is teaching phonics, and they actually think there's nothing we can do about anything else. I think this kind of uh, statement should be um, eradicated, and that's one of the major challenges that we have. We need to develop more comprehensive models of the relationships between language and reading and then convince policymakers of their importance. I also think we need to think in the domain of reading and language a little bit more about how we think about risk. It's undoubtedly the case that studies of children who are at family risk of dyslexia because they have a first degree affected relative have been very instrumental in uh, developing our understanding of the, uh, of the language deficits that accompany or predispose children to dyslexia. But in these studies, people only ever measure the reading of the affected relative. They don't go beyond reading typically to measure language or a executive function, attention, and of course, so we don't really know what other heritable risks are in play, are in play uh, determining or, or um, increasing the risk of um, some kind of longer term language learning impairment. There's also commonly believed, especially in educational circles, that environmental factors are important and two that have been particularly uh, interesting, uh, of interest to policymakers and indeed researchers are uh, the home literacy environment and also the extent to which individuals themselves read or print exposure, the amount of reading for pleasure that a child does outside of, of school. But we now know that really these, um, these aspects of environment, which have very powerful effects on uh, individual differences in learning to read, are really examples of genes acting through the environment. And that's really important because there is an increasing tendency for people to think they can fix these disorders just by changing the environment. And so charities, for instance, many charities are involved in giving books to children in less advantaged families to try and help those children learn to read. Um, and I, I, I find it very distressing and often will tell these charities, you know, well, what are you telling the parents to do? Because actually they think the provision of books is the question, is the, is the issue, and it really isn't. So clearly we just need to continue to develop our understanding of what it means to be at risk of a reading and language disorder and that is a prerequisite for developing theoretically sound interventions. But this is not meant to be a council of despair because it's becoming increasingly clear that good interventions can be developed based on um, theories of the relationship between reading and language and um, those interventions uh, can be effective. In a program of research which our group has done using randomized control trials, we've shown positive effects um, of interventions delivered by trained practitioners um, working with parents in the early years, working with uh, early years um, teachers. We've also shown powerful effects on the, early, uh, on the ways of teaching decoding by uh, teaching assistants and also language interventions to promote reading comprehension. None of these interventions have been very long. We've mainly got funding for 20 weeks, um, but the effect sizes are very credible from 0.3 at the low end to uh, over one. Um, and we strongly believe that sustained uh, interventions would have much greater benefits. Of course, there are issues when you come to uh, fidelity of delivery if you want to scale these interventions up. And in the UK, in the work that we've done uh, with third-party providers, 
looking at our interventions produce um, smaller effect sizes, uh, but nonetheless, again, they're not being sustained. The problems and the obstacles when we've tried to use these interventions in uh, developing countries are even greater. So um, in terms of a future challenge, I think there are incredible challenges around implementation and uh, scale-up, and also we need to know much more about how we help children who are resistant to intervention. So um, can we meet this challenge? Well, I've learned this phrase, theory of change, which is what policymakers uh, like to like to have, it seems to me that we have a number of challenges which are still, many of them are still fairly low level. We still need to increase public awareness of reading and language disorders. And in a consensus study led by Dorothy Bishop and published in JCPP a couple of years ago now, um, we, we used the um, a method um, to gain consensus about the nature and terminology of developmental language disorder, and that work has been hugely, hugely influential, uh, I think certainly in Europe and, uh, and in English-speaking countries. For dyslexia, I'm afraid we still have to do work to dispel the myth. The myth has re-emerged. The myth is that dyslexia doesn't exist. Those of you who work with it will know that it does exist and it can be very debilitating. For policymakers, we need to convince them that language is a foundation for education and that we need sustained approaches so there are no quick fixes. Professionals and parents, as ever, need more information and support. And for researchers, I think the research agenda is actually open. I've not mentioned brains or genes. I've not mentioned polygenic scores. Um, I think there are critical phases that we need to think about. I know it's an unfashionable concept, but if there are small windows in which we can intervene, we need to know what those windows are. And I think we need to be doing more robust trials to validate our causal models of what works. So thank you very much. I should now introduce Frankie, who I consider to be my younger sibling, Got because we are descended from the same mentor. Thank you. What a very nice introduction. And what an incredible um, privilege to be here and to be able to talk to such an illustrious audience. So I hope my slides will appear, yes. So I'm going to look back to look forward and I'm um, celebrating at the same time that JCPP is celebrating its 60th birthday, I'm celebrating 30 years in autism research, 30 years since I was lucky enough to start my PhD with Uta Frith. So a slightly personal timeline and I'm going to whiz through seven ways in which the concept of autism has changed and the implications <laughs> for future research. So firstly, autism has changed from in, for example, the 1980s, a very narrow concept of infantile autism defined by pervasive lack of responsiveness to other people, gross deficits in language, and still being defined by its distinction from schizophrenia, having previously been called, uh, of course, infantile uh, child with schizophrenia, by the absence of delusions. In the 80s, infantile autism was largely accompanied by intellectual disability. If you were working in uh, the area, you were testing and working with children in special schools who typically had intellectual disability and often had minimal language. And the fight was still on for specialist services. Now we have the notion of autism spectrum disorder, a much, much wider concept with a much broader range of manifestations being recognized and uh, multiple diagnoses also being allowed for the first time in DSM-5, which I'll come back to. Now, among those diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, intellectual disability is a minority group, and rather than fighting for specific services, as we've heard already from Temi's talk, we may need services that actually are expert in a range of different um, diagnoses and different difficulties. What's the implication for research? Well, I think intellectual disability and developmental language disorder are hugely under-researched and underfunded, really the poor cousin to autism in many respects. And autism accompanied by intellectual disability or language disorder are hugely neglected in research. So minimally verbal children and adults are very rarely involved in studies. And yet we're probably at the point in technological advance where we can most access and include those groups because we can move beyond 
methods of testing and assessment that are language-based. Um, and Mark Johnson and others have done wonderful work with tablet-based eye tracking, for example. But you'll know there are all kinds of wearables that we could be using to be more imaginative in our research and involve these groups. The second way in which the concept of autism has changed, which is, of course, related to that widening of the concept, is that autism has gone from being a very rare disorder to being a very common disorder or condition. So in the 1980s, we had an estimate of maybe 6 in 10,000 children affected by autism and were still battling very much against underdiagnosis. Now we have an estimate of one in 100 individuals meeting criteria for that autism spectrum disorder diagnosis, and some people talking about maybe overdiagnosis. And there's certainly been diagnostic substitution with children and adults who previously were described as having intellectual disability now being described as primarily having autism. Is this a real increase in the incident of autism? That would be important to know because it would suggest a strong environmental factor since genetic factors don't move that fast. But it's unlikely that there has been a real increase, at least based on probably reliable UK data through the NHS. And instead, it's almost certainly to do with that widening of the diagnostic criteria, changing awareness, improving services, and diagnostic substitution. Alongside the change from a rare to a common disorder, we've also seen an explosion in the research field and in the number of papers published. So when I started my PhD in 1988, while I was hopelessly naive to think that if I read all the papers about autism and had them all out physically in front of me on, the, on a table, I was going to bring it all together and make some huge uh, advance. That was hopelessly naive, but it wasn't hopelessly naive to have read all the papers about autism. At that point, there were less than 2,600 papers on autism, and about 180 papers were published in that year. So you really could read everything. Now, it's a much harder task. So uh, in the last year alone, there were more than 6,000 papers with autism in the title, and uh, a, a whole body of corpus of uh, more than 66,000 papers. The second uh, implication from that second change, from rare to common, is that research now moves from small-scale studies to making large-scale studies possible. And I think there's still room for small boutique studies to answer targeted questions through sophisticated experimental design, but the need for replication means that we appreciate the need for larger numbers. And that means that collaboration and consortia are going to be increasingly important, as well as the use of big data and routine data, as we've already heard about in the previous talks. Alongside that, we don't want to only have uh, global crude measures, so deep phenotyping, again, maybe using technology to collect data at scale is really exciting. But in order to merge data sets, we need to have agreed shared protocols, and we need to think about how good our shared measures are. And often the psychometric validity of measures that are commonly used hasn't really been interrogated. And there's another challenge, which is that we have to learn how to reward sharing of data. And we have to think about how early career scientists can make their mark and make their name when they're one among 50 authors, rather than being the first author on a small study. Among that change from rare to common, I want to just highlight the change from thinking that autism is a hugely predominantly male condition to recognizing that women are affected too and that women are probably under-recognized uh, and under-diagnosed at present. So uh, changing from a male to female estimate, estimated ratio of five or even 10 to one at the um, Asperger end, the end of the autism spectrum with good intellectual functioning, to recognizing that in well-ascertained epidemiological studies, the, uh, the ratio is more like three to one and probably doesn't change as much across the ability range, suggesting that who we've really missed are those high-functioning or those intellectually able autistic women. The implications for research clearly that we must include female participants and traditionally some studies have explicitly excluded females because they expected to recruit too few. We must include them but if we only include those who meet current diagnostic criteria and have managed to jump all the hoops and hurdles to get a diagnosis in a system that is almost certainly male biased, how could it not be when it's been based largely on male data, data from male participants, then we're in danger of circularity. We must study individuals who have high autistic traits who may not have had um, a diagnosis. And we need to do research urgently to identify if our diagnostic criteria and processes are gender fair. I very much doubt they are. And if they're not, how to make them so.
The third change in concept is from thinking of autism as a childhood condition to recognizing that it is a lifespan condition. And it's really been quite a slow realization for many uh, people that most autistic people are adults and most autistic people, God willing, will live most of their lives as adults. So a lot of adults are still coming for late diagnosis, for first diagnosis, even in their 60s and 70s. And even though we recognize that we're not talking about infantile autism, but an autism spectrum across the lifespan, there's still very, very little awareness of autism in adult mental, mental health and physical health services, and very little awareness, I think, among old age psychiatrists. And yet we could expect, and there's some evidence of increased rates of physical ill health due to stress, isolation, uh, reduced help seeking, and so on. So much more research is needed. I'm just going to very briefly tell you about some work that's, uh, um, that we recently completed with uh, Dr. Ezra Yara, who was a PhD student with myself and Pat Howland. And uh, she looked at social cognition in young and old adults on the autism spectrum. Uh, she used a range of tasks, but this is the reading the mind and the eyes task, Simon Baron Cohen's task, where you have to choose which of the four words best matches what you think this person from their eyes is thinking or feeling or experiencing. In typically developing older adults, uh, there's a fairly well-documented decrease in performance on this task. And yet in our adults on the autism spectrum, we found no such age-related decrease. Of course, this is cross-sectionally. Um, and that meant that although the young groups, the young adult groups, showed what's been replicated many times in the literature, that the autism group were less good at reading the mind in the eyes, in the older adults, that was no longer true. So maybe some kind of uh, preservation, which is interesting to think about, or uh, protective effect in the autism group. The fourth change in autism concept is from thinking of autism as something quite discrete, as a distinct entity, to, as Robert has already spoken about, as in most uh, complex conditions, thinking dimensionally. So we know that the behavioral traits that define autism are in fact continuously distributed in the general population. Uh, cognitively, maybe a more interesting question, but genetically, again, autism for most people is just like height, the product of hundreds of common genetic variants, each of tiny effect, and Roberts explained that beautifully already, and also already talked about polygenic scores, which I think when we have them robustly for autism will really have a major impact on the research field. But there's an important public engagement topic here. Uh, we've shown in a twin study nested within Roberts' uh, twin, twins early development study, we've shown looking at the children with autism or high autistic traits, that the same genetic influences apply to diagnosed autism and to individual variation in subclinical autistic traits. And again, that's a really important basis for that polygenic work. The fifth change in concept is from thinking of autism as one thing to thinking of it as many things. And I want to suggest this is true in two respects. In the first respect, that autism is hugely heterogeneous. And many people now talk about the autisms to reflect etiological heterogeneity, that one person's autism probably has a different origin from another person's aut autism. And so one of the reasons we haven't made more progress in understanding the genetics or neurobiology of autism may be that we've been mixing apples and oranges. And there's a lot of work going on, including from the huge um, uh, EU AIMS uh, study, to look for stratification biomarkers to try and find out and make sense of that biological heterogeneity within autism for personalized interventions for co-occurring conditions. Um, and many people are studying rare genetic causes to find the final common pathway in idiopathic, so-called idiopathic autism. That's an interesting approach and it has um, pros and cons and people who are very much in support and people who would say it may not be as promising as expected. Happy to talk about that in questions. The second way in which autism has changed from being one thing to being many, I would suggest, is as uh, Angelica Ronald and, and I have proposed, that the features of autism, even in a single individual, can be fractionated. They have different genetic origins. And when we look across individuals, we can find many individuals who only have one aspect of what currently defines autism. So although to have an autism diagnosis, you must have social and communication difficulties and rigid and repetitive traits, in the general population, we find these have different genetic origins and they, they split apart so that the most common presentation you'll find in a general population sample are individuals who have problems in just one of these key areas. And what help do these children get? What diagnosis do these children get? We don't know. 
At the cognitive level, I've also suggested that autism can be thought of as a composite condition. There is no single cognitive explanation for the different facets of autism, even in a single individual. And that we should think of autism as arising from a combination of different psychological cognitive characteristics or difficulties or styles. This means that because some of these aspects, such as executive function difficulties, will not be specific to autism, transdiagnostic research is really important. But also that we should start to think about which parts of this pattern are actually um, difficulties or cognitive uh, challenges, and which bits actually reflect compensation, or the inverse of compensation, as Mark Johnson has suggested, that executive dysfunctions are so common across all uh, neurodevelopmental dis difficulties, maybe because when you don't have good executive function, any problem you have is going to be more obvious as a challenge because you can't compensate so well, and maybe also true for dyslexia. The sixth change I want to highlight, um, and there are only seven, so I've only finished, is from thinking of autism as pure to thinking of autism as complex. So, as I mentioned, DSM-5 has allowed for the first time multiple diagnoses, which is really extraordinary. Up until 2013, at least in DSM-5, if you had autism, you weren't allowed to have anything else. You couldn't have autism and anxiety. You couldn't have autism and ADHD. And yet we know that pure autism is very rare and co-occurring conditions are absolutely the norm. And much of what makes life hard for people on the autism spectrum is not the core autism, I would say, but the associated problems. Epilepsy, intellectual disability, developmental language disorder, sleep, eating, bowel problems, discrimination, bullying and trauma, and mental health problems, particularly anxiety, also depression, and we know that tragically the rates of suicide are much elevated in autism. And research is, is urgently needed to identify why there are such high rates of co-occurring problems, Twin studies suggest that in some cases there are shared genetic predispositions, and in other cases it may be that living with autism in a neurotypical world is just very stressful, and that actually we could make mental health outcomes much better by changing the environment. We also need to know what treatments will work and for whom. And lastly, autism has changed or is changing from being thought of as a developmental disorder to the neurodiversity or neurodivergent approach, where we move from a medical model where the challenges that a person with autism faces in the world are situated in that person, that the autistic person has difficulties with X, Y, or Z, to a more social model of disability where the difficulties that emerge are due to the interaction, the challenges to live in a neurotypical world as an autistic person. And since the dimensional notion of autism and autistic traits has no qualitative cut point, then for current autistic diagnosis, the cut point is when your traits become impairing. If you have a lot of autistic traits, but you find a niche where they really work for you, you're not going to need a diagnosis. In fact, you don't warrant a diagnosis because you're not impaired. And if impairment is a function of your environment and context, then your diagnosis could come and go. Like the um, adult who comes for first diagnosis to the, to the tertiary referral center, and at 70, needs an autism diagnosis because having retired or his wife having died, the traits that up to now he lived with happily are now disabling to him because other aspects of his life no longer support and scaffold and fit his needs. So we can imagine a possible world where autism was not disabling in the absence of additional comorbid difficulties like intellectual disability, given appropriate accommodations by society. And in that case, what will autism be? What will pure autism be? Would it be a diagnosis? Would it be a personality type? Would it just be a different way of thinking? And what concept of autism will we have in 2029? So part of that change is also a change from scientist-led to more participatory and co-designed research. Traditionally, parent scientists have been incredibly influential in the area of autism. So Lorna Wing, Bernard Rimland, who really pushed forward uh, the research agenda. And then in the States, parent-led charities raised huge funds and lobbied and attracted scientists who had never thought of working in autism before and searching for a cure, which now many people on the autism spectrum find entirely unacceptable. They would say it's no more appropriate to look for a cure for autism than it was for um, psychiatrists 30, 40 years ago to think it was appropriate to cure homosexuality. They have a different way of processing the world, but not a deficient one. 
So it's a new era of stakeholder-led research where we must involve autistic people from the get-go in designing research. But how do we ensure that all voices are heard? How do we ensure that the full range of the spectrum, including those who have intellectual disability and those who have language disorder, how do we make sure that all voices are heard? So uh, to finish, there are lots of challenges and lots of opportunities. From the big data science that we can do really well in the UK, thanks to the NHS and routine health records and the National Pupil Database, to build bigger data sets going forward if we can develop agreed shared protocols and best practice tools and ethics for sharing data. We need to incentivize open data, sharing and collaboration. If we recognize the co-occurrence and overlap of difficulties that most autistic people face, we must have transdiagnostic working. And new technology should allow detailed data be, to be collected at scale. So that's all really exciting, and I think there is still so much to find out. Some of, personally, what I think are neglected topics include language impairment in autism, diagnosis in females, autism in low- and middle-income countries. We know that 80% of autism research is done in high-income countries. 80% of people on the autism spectrum live in low- and middle-income countries. Motor aspects of autism, hugely under-researched, including catatonia. We need evidence-based educational practice, which really doesn't exist, or only in tiny pockets adult peer-to-peer -peer support for people receiving late diagnosis, more research on aging, depression, trauma, and post-traumatic stress disorder, and the list goes on. So a, a lot to do in the future, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my enthusiasm with you. Well, five really inspiring talks. I think if there were any junior researchers out there who weren't already excited about working in the field of child psychology and psychiatry. I'm sure you are now. Thank you so much to our speakers. So can I invite you to, to come up to the, to the desk here at the front and we will have some discussion and questions from the audience. First question is from my dear colleague Essie Vidding. Hi, um, this is a question for Bradley Peterson, but maybe a little bit to Temi as well. Given what Temi was presenting about uh, the P fact and people moving in and out of diagnostic categories, having comorbid conditions, what would developmental neural fingerprinting look like? Do you think it would fall as neatly as the data that uh, you presented for the? Um, for the kind of the adult groups, I assume they were adult groups. Um, yeah, it's a great question, and certainly during Terry's talk, I was having the same question, and I, it's not the first time I've had it. So let me just explain that actually, those weren't all adults. So the schizophrenia bipolar comparison, those were adults. Um, Tourette's were all kids, ADHD, all kids. Uh, depression was a, a, across the lifespan. Um, so you know, it's a brief talk. I couldn't go through all the methods, and you wouldn't want me to. But um, all of the imaging measures, we can at, at each point on each surface of every brain structure, we can partial out certain um, uh, covariates. So we we partial out the effects of age. We partial out the effects of sex, socioeconomic status, and ethnicity. So um, with within each age group that we studied in, in comparison. They were, um, the morphological measures represented the mean age of the sample. And um, so, so I'm, I'm not sure what we would see if we, if we didn't do that. Um, and we didn't test it, we just thought it was necessary to do it. Um, I will say that in our samples, in, in, the, in the groups for whom we had both kids and adults, um, the algorithms perform equally well regardless of age. Um, it, they performed equally well regardless of whether the participants, participants were on medicine or not. It seemed to be very, very robust to those um, sort of accidental qualities of the participants. Um, and so how to reconcile that with Terry's talk, I don't know. I mean, in, in part, these were, you know, these were research samples, so they were, um, um, they were drawn from lots of NIH studies where we were fortunate enough to have the same uh, 
imaging sequence and processed with the same methods and tools. And so we could compare apples and apples. Um, uh, and they were, so those were, there was no doubt clinically, you know, this was combined type ADHD. This was clearly bipolar. Um, this was clearly schizophrenia. Um, in a representative sample in the community, uh, I, I'm not sure, you know, it, it's anyone's guess. It's an empirical question how it would perform. I will say, though, that it, it was robust also with respect to comorbid illnesses. So, you know, these were really the primary clinical problems of the kids and adults. It, you know, the, the ADHD kids had, you know, it was bread and butter, hit you in the face kind of ADHD. There's no question about that. Um, and, and the comorbid illnesses didn't seem to, have, well, they didn't affect diagnostic classification at all. Before we move on to the next question, Tendi, would you like to comment? Okay. Um, uh, I can see a, a really huge research program trying to resolve this, this question. So uh, one of the first things I wanted to say is that in, in case you're sitting there thinking, oh, this is something very funny about what happens in New Zealand. Uh, <laughs> where people just go randomly in and out of disorders. There was a paper published in JAMA Psychiatry last week that, if you didn't see it, has used the Danish national registers and followed the Danish population for a large number of years and shown that people are going in and out of disorders uh, in their register data, which are recording people who are receiving treatment, either in the hospital or in outpatient clinics. Um, so I was a little bit... Um, reassured that it's, it's not only a crazy thing that happens in New Zealand. Um, I think what it does raise questions about is um, uh, what's the role of, of biomarkers that all of us work on, not just the neuroimaging biomarkers, but the genetic biomarkers, the other kinds of biomarkers that we use in differential diagnosis. So that's something that this kind of throws up a whole new question. And do we need to be thinking um, that whatever is the presenting disorder that a person has at the moment when they come in for clinical treatment, although we might think that they've had other disorders in the past and they may be at risk of having different kinds of disorders in the future, they, you still need to treat the one that they've got today. So the, the clinical question still calls for this kind of biomarker work in differential diagnosis. And then I think the other thing that the, the, um, the, uh, find, the new findings about uh, people moving in and out of disorders suggest is that uh, any of our biomarkers, we need to hold them to this, um, what was the holy grail standard? The, the standard of predictive prognosis, so long-term predictive prognosis. So I would like to see all of Brad's patients followed up in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and see what we learn from the data then. Great research program. Well, I, don't, I was actually going to just say exactly the same thing. We need to follow them up, don't we? And maybe the brain is an awful lot more plastic than we thought if these people are moving around with, the, with your algorithms as well, as with the Temi's data. If I can just say that in some of these samples, especially in the, the depressed, we, we have learned that the bra brains are plastic, at least some of the features, like cortical thickness. You, you get better in depression, and the abnormality goes away. Um, and, and we've shown it over 10-week clinical trials. So it's not over years or you know, decades. It's, it's over a matter of weeks. Uh, uh, oh. yes, sorry, this is a, another question for Brad Peterson. Uh, I wonder what you make out of the uh, Enigma studies. I'm here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Brad. So, as you know, the, the Enigma studies in the meta-analysis in psychiatric disorders show tiny effects. In ADHD, the surface area is not abnormal anymore in adults or in adolescents, only in kids. I know that your analysis is completely different, but as an imaging expert, I wonder what your thoughts are on those tiny effects in the meta-analysis in ADHD and also OCD and other disorders. Uh, I, I, wish I, I wish this weren't being filmed, so, <laughs> you know, the the leaders of Enigma are very dear friends, and I respect them just immensely and tremendously, and, and, and it's really an important project. I will say that um, there are limitations of big data, and, and a lot of the, imp so some of Enigma's fMRI, and personally I think fMRI is very, very noisy data, uh, and, and there's lots of reasons for that. Um, 
and difficult to classify and get consistency across samples. So many reasons for the noise uh, that we won't go into. Anatomical, if I, I said that um, we believe that, so automated anatomical image processing has a real place. Uh, it's inexpensive, it's rapid, uh, and you rely on large numbers to average out noise, kind of like a brainstem auditory evoked response. Right? So noise averages out. With individuals, noise is deadly. And so we don't, we've tried uh, some of the automated processing platforms and building algorithms. We weren't able to do it. We need really, really high quality data in, in order to uh, pull out the diagnostic features and the algorithms to perform well. So I think in these multi-site studies, especially anatomical, you're bringing data in, platform, imaging platforms different, uh, Samples are different, ascertainment bias is different, comorbidities, treatment, you got, and then the image processing methods are noisy. And so I don't think that, so I think you're, you're averaging out not only noise, you're averaging out signal. <coughs> and and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's some of the limitations of big data. You know, gar <laughs> noise in, noise out. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask a different um, sort of question. I'm going to ask a question to each of the five speakers on the panel. Um, before I ask the question, I'm going to just say there is one thing that you are not allowed to have in your answer, and that's research funding. Um, one of the observations from all the talks, but uh, you know, at a sort of you know occasion like today, is that one of the frustrations of being a, um, a clinical scientist, as many of us are, is that sort of sometimes. Um, you think, yes, we are making progress, and it's fantastic to hear these talks of looking, people looking about work that's taken 20, 30, 40 years to do. But of course, actually, sometimes the pace of change and translation into practice, meaningful differences to patients' lives, is frustratingly slow. Certainly, patients and their parents you know, um, are, are of that opinion too. So, the question to each of you is could you briefly say, um, for when we come back in 10 years' time for the 70th anniversary, what in your field do you think is most holding back the rate of change and what would you like to see <coughs> different so that we maximize the progress that we're going to make over the next 10 years, but you can't say research funding? Great, thanks. Great question, Tony, and, and really easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I need a bit of time to think. <laughs> I think, I think in, in autism it's heterogeneity. I think just the heterogeneity within the spectrum and, and maybe the polygenic risk scores will help us understand that a bit better. I think I was going to give a similar answer to that but also just thinking about uh, Temi's talk because I think it's exactly the same with the neurodevelopmental disorders, of course. And um, with a diagnosis of <coughs> dyslexia, I think we've been mindful for many years now that if you see a, a family with dyslexia and you, you give the quotes diagnosis that you must always say, it's, but there are some language problems and you might find the attention problems get worse as a child gets older and so on. So I think it is the conceptualization of the, it's the, it's the way in which we are classifying the disorders which really has to be looked at. And that's particularly from, in my field, I mean, I think language and reading is probably the same disorder. At least in imaging, I would, outside of funding, I would, I would say that, um, that what's been help holding us back most prominently is poor study design. So until recently, 90% or more, maybe 95% of studies were just simply case control fairly small numbers, understandably because of the expense of imaging and so forth, but simple case control studies that, you know, so prone to ascertainment bias and almost everything, you know, I, I think it's largely responsible for non-replication across sites and, um, and, and inability to infer cause or, you know, or, or interpret the data properly. So, um, you know, you would, you would make developmental interpretations on cross-sectional data. I mean. That's a no-no. You don't, you don't do that. I mean, you, or at least it's a preliminary, um, uh, you know, a, ge generates a preliminary hypothesis, but you have to test it in longitudinal studies. So imaging studies now are, are, they're much better designed. So they're being truly longitudinal. They're being conducted in representative sort of epi samples. Uh, much, much better characterization of, of the participants. Um, yoking to interventions, 
So now you can, with randomized control trials, you can actually see what we're doing to change the brain. So I think that's a, a huge leap forward and it will continue to improve. That, you know, I think no case control studies are now being funded for, for good reasons and, and that will revolutionize um, the imaging field. Uh, of course, I would say this, but I think more uh, longitudinal cohort studies, just as, as you mentioned, uh, you would think that there's been a lot of these with a lot of data on mental health, uh, followed people through time and look at their mental health, but in fact, uh, they're sort of, those studies are sort of old-fashioned, and many of the ones that have done a good job of phenotyping and uh, studying people's mental health um, are quite old now. Uh, in the United States, there wasn't any effort made for the last 20 years to fund any new ones. Now some new large cohorts are being funded, but they're doing quite superficial data collection and measurement. So I think the, att the attention to really good measurement of mental health and following people through time uh, is going to, I hope, will become important again. So that's thing number one that I think we need. The other thing I think we need is um, better training path for young uh, researchers who are interest, interested in um, psychiatric epidemiology. That's almost all disappeared in the United States. There are only a couple of universities that still train anybody in psychiatric epidemiology. Uh, even here in Britain, there's good training, but the career path is not clear. So it's uh, we need to do something to make this an attractive field to go into and a promising field for young people to choose. Um, all traits in child psychology and psychiatry are heritable, substantially so, and we now have the tools to find some of those genes. But what we need are huge GWAS studies, and it's not necessarily funding. There are other ways I showed that we can get those large GWAS studies, but what I want to make it clear is that once you do those large GWAS studies, you can use the results from those studies to create polygenic scores that you can use in any study even with relatively small sample sizes. I hardly stand it that I have to say that we probably only have time for one more question. But we need to, yes, please. This is a question for Terry uh, from a, a historical question, as you would expect from a psychiatric antique. Um, <laughs> I was half surprised by the enormous diversity of outcomes. Only half because, as you know, Terry, in 1966, Lee Robbins published Deviant Children Grown Up. And uh, there was an enormous diversity of the, ex of the children who had suffered externalizing disorders. Uh, but the children who had uh, shown uh, internalizing disorders in general, had rather a good prognosis, mm -hmm. and if they remained problematic, they were often depressed. Now, these were children born in the 1920s and 1930s, even before the JCPP. Uh, wh wh it wasn't an epidemiological study, but it was, uh, it was pretty good from that point of view. It was all the children <clears throat> from a group of child psychiatric clinics. So why have... Um, children born in New Zealand in the 1960s and 70s um, who are depressed got this enormously different <coughs> outcome. Hmm. This is Philip Graham, who has been very supportive of me since I came to Britain 23 years ago and always asked me the very hardest question. Um, so thank you for that. You know, I'm not sure. I. Uh, I'm wondering what kind of selection factors there might have been into the clinics where Lee was getting her data, because I, I'm not sure exactly at that time what brought a child into treatment for an internalizing disorder, for depression or anxiety. Um, and I, I just don't know the history of psychiatry in America that well. I do know a lot about how, how the conduct disorder children uh, got brought in, and of course there was no ADHD at the time. Uh, so we're just really talking about conduct disorder, but there were um, 
it was mainly through the, the schools and when children were fighting in school and harming other children, then they would be um, brought into what were called reform schools. I guess they were Borstals here. So maybe there was a different type of selection factor on who, who comes in and the more severe children were going into the reform schools, treatment settings, and people with uh, children who were treated for anxiety and depression might have come from more well-to-do homes where their parents were concerned about them. That's just a hunch that it might have been different populations that the children were drawn from, but I don't know if that's true. Does anybody else know? Okay. As always, the great challenge, Philip. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, as I said, I'm sure we could easily continue this conversation all evening and into tomorrow, but we can't, unfortunately. I think the Wellcome Trust will throw us out. Um, I would like to thank our absolutely amazing panel for one of the <laughs> It just leaves uh, Cathy to come and give some closing remarks. Um. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. OK. It's my very happy task to bring the formal bit to a close. I have three quick thanks. And then, because I come from a background in early education and care, I have the birthday cake. OK. <laughs> so the first thank uh, goes to all the brilliant speakers. Um, I won't try to summarize or say anything about all of you, but thanks so much. And we're all very grateful. The second thanks will go to Wiley Blackwell, who have contributed to our being here today and who have contributed to the kava and the canapes to which you are all invited when this is over. So thanks to Wiley Blackwell. Yeah. The third thanks goes to every one of you, our brilliant audience. Thank you for coming. But I'd also like to thank our audience who joined us via the internet. So thanks a lot, wherever you are, uh, for getting up in the middle of the night or very early in the morning. So thanks. Now, yeah. The birthday cake goes to the team who brought you the anniversary issue. We have to have birthday cake. And there are three people who are the main people on this team that brought us the issue. Will you come up and get you cake? It's Edmund Sanugaba, please come up <laughs> for your cake. OK. The second one is Pasco Firon. Come up and get your cake. Yeah. And the third one is Prava Chabina. Thanks a lot, Prava. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, yeah. And I think we now can go and have our cover. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have a napkin. <laughs>